Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to see you here today for Zoom and also live stream. Um, we've been talking about some of the interruptions and uh, blocking of emails that's going on right now from Google, uh, who's using uh, using AI apparently to target a number of different people and organizations. So we're trying to find ways around it. And, uh, you know, you can uh, contact me or Jay uh, and we'll try to try to help you work it out. But it's it's an ongoing situation right now. All right. Today, we're continuing our study in Revelation one through three. Today, we're at Thyatira in Revelation two, 18 through twenty nine. Verse 18 says, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Thyatira was about 40 miles from Pergamum and in a rural farm community. The church was likely formed there by the Apostle Paul and Lydia was a native of Thyatira. Thyatira has been mentioned in Acts 16.14 as the home of Lydia, who was converted at Philippi. Now, it's likely the church began when she and her household returned. The three churches, Ephesus, um, Smyrna, and Pergamum, were on the coast, and others were in the interior. Thyatira was southeast of Pergamus and northeast of Smyrna. Uh, it's still a place of about 17,000 people, nearly 3,000 professed to be Christians. In the second century, Thyatira was overrun by the Cataphrygian heresy. The Turks now have a number of mosques there, but there's not one Christian church or place of worship to be found there. Who was this church's angel or pastor in the epistles writing? We're not sure. Thyatira is the same as Thygatyra, which signifies a daughter. Seleucius, the son of Nicanor, uh, being at war with Lysimachus and hearing that he had a daughter born, called this city Thygatyra. It was also called Palopia and Semiramis previous to that, which is a very fit name for this church and expresses the uh, F, uh, the you know effeminacy of it uh, when of course the Virgin Mary uh, who the Roman Catholics call the daughter of God was more worshipped than her son and was uh, not only made a partner with him in the business of salvation unbelievable this is why the corrupt corrupt Jezebel is mentioned concerning this city you know, there was once a she-pope there also. But the Roman Catholic Church is also called the Great Whore, the Mother of Harlots, the Woman Who Rides the Beast. Dr. Davos um, observed that the first Christian of Thyatira was a woman and that the false prophets who first entired the, uh, enticed the Christians to apostasy in this church were women, such as Maximilia, uh, Quintilia and Priscilla, to which I would add that according to Ephaneus, um, among these heretics which swallowed up the church, their bishops were women, and so were their presbyters or elders. Uh, and uh, the guy who wrote this is the, of the opinion that the inhabitants of that place, when heathen, were worshiper, worshipers of the goddess Diana. So that upon all accounts, the church here is a fit symbol for the Church of Rome and its worship of Mary. Since this church was singled out for much rebuke and condemnation, Jesus presents himself as the one whose eyes are like fire and feet like bronze. You know, fire is often a picture of judgment in the Bible. You know, you've got all these third wave people trying to slay people in the spirits going, fire, fire, fire. Let's have the fire come down on him. <laughs> and I'm like, 
you do know that fire is judgment from God in the Bible. But first, Jesus commends those who are faithful. In verse 19, it says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. So now we got some more precepts. Precept number 17 is practice charity. We've already covered works or deeds that prove our faith. The Bible also talks about love and charity. Love is the only thing that truly lasts. Faith and hope, well, you know what? They'll no longer be necessary in the new heaven and earth, but love remains for eternity. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We also show our faith through love and compassion toward one another in the unity of the Spirit. Philippians 2, 1 through 2, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if ever any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and pur purpose. We need to go beyond love for our neighbor and fellow believers in that we all are also told to love our enemies those who curse and persecute us. Oh, really? Hmm. Luke 6, 27, 28 says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who ill treat you. Matthew 5, 44 through 48, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. You know, those who have gone astray into false doctrines and false practice, we must still pray and attempt to pull them from the fire. Of course, as Jude said, being careful not to get our clothes stained by contact with them. And you know what? They must also be rebuked. But we should also pray for them. Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Titus 1, 10 through 14, for there are many uh, rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the uncircumcision group. <clears throat> they must be silenced because they're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Well, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebu rebuke them sharply, so they'll be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or the, com the commands of those who eject the truth. 1 John 5, 16, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. Now, it's not guaranteed if you pray for somebody, they will be born again. But they'll have a much better chance if the Lord grants them repentance and they actually do repent. Precept number 18 is this, be a servant. We discussed faith and remaining faithful, which is also mentioned here. Jesus told us to be servants 
and that the person who wanted to come out ahead would have to be a servant. Mark 9, 35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last, the servant of all. Jesus demonstrated that to us by being the servant to all mankind, by dying on the cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 10, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name, name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So being a servant also means that we have a master. <clears throat> Our master is Jesus Christ, as Christ was obedient to his father. Even at the point of death, it's crucial today to understand what Jesus prayed. Luke twenty two forty two, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. He also taught us to pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 6, 9, this then is how we should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is worth repeating because today we have many false teachers in the NAR and third wave. They're saying that you should never pray to God, thy will be done. Instead, just speak positively and declare what you want God to be done to do and it will be done but that's a patent false doctrine as jesus himself submitted to the will of the father and taught us to do likewise benny hinn famously once said never ever ever go to the lord and say if it's thy will that is the mantra of the word of faith preachers who teach their followers they can summon god as balaam tried to do no we must be a servant. Do the will of the Father, not your will. And that's really a main point of Christianity. Precept number 19 is this. Do more than you did at first. Our Christian life, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, must bear, bear fruit and will bear fruit. We will grow and mature if we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our Christian life. If we haven't seen any growth, you know what? We better, number one, check to see if we're saved. And number two, see if we are living in rebellion in our old sinful nature. Either way, we're going to lose if we don't repent. Growth should be evident as it was in the Thyatira church. First Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, babes crave uh, pure spiritual milk so that by it you may you may grow up in your salvation second peter 3 18 but grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory now and forever amen ephesians 4 15 instead speaking the truth in love we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is christ and back to verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You know what? If you're not growing, you may have lost your connection to Christ. Colossians 2.19, he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as god causes it to grow you mean a christian can lose the connection with the head calvinists don't like that we will also bear fruit as believers others will come to know christ through our witness and ministry to the body of christ john 15 8 this is my father to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
And you know, if we don't bear fruit, then basically we're worthless and in danger of utter destruction. John 15, 2 through 6, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. We are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. We have to remain, folks. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Some would say this sounds like work salvation, trying to buy deeds to be saved, but it's just the opposite of that. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Only Christ can save. One past moment of faith is a good start, obviously, but it's not the whole picture. As James said, if we have faith that continues, it will evidence itself in works and fruit. James 2.18. But someone will, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. On to verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, the original Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, king of Israel, in the time of Elijah. She not only corrupted the entire house of Ahab, but also Israel, causing them to worship Baal and Ashtaroth. It was so bad that Elijah thought he was the only faithful person left in Israel. I wonder if you feel that way today. But God kept 7,000 faithful to himself and encouraged Elijah with that knowledge. The descendants of De Jezebel also corrupted Judah. Jezebel can also be seen to represent the Ca Roman Catholic Church, as it has been led astray by a demon that is posing as Mary, the mother of Jesus, in appar apparitions. Whether or not this was a prophecy of the Roman Church, this is also a very specific teaching to Christians at Thyatira. This Jezebel was a woman in the Thyatira church. In the Syriac and other versions of the Bible, it is translated, you tolerate your wife, Jezebel. She could have been a prominent woman in the church or even the pastor's wife. This woman was allowed to falsely prophesy and get people to follow her into sexual immorality and detestable practices. She used false prophecy, pretending to speak directly from God, to per uh, persuade people to follow her sinful ways. And we see this technique today everywhere. Many say that they're speaking directly from God, who has spoken to or appeared to them in dreams or whatever. Many are not afraid to claim that almost every word out of their mouths is a direct word of God. Those kind of people need rebuke. But most are afraid to stand up to them for fear of lawsuits or seeming intolerant or unloving. But that's not what the Bible tells us to do as a body of Christ. We must judge prophecy and test the spirits. Precept number 20 is test the spirits. These people and their words must be tested. 1 John 4, 1, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. If they're found to be false prophets, that either do, uh, you know, their prophecies either don't come true or are against the precepts of Scripture, then we're to watch out for them. Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They pretend to be one, one of the people in God's church, but you know what? They're really not. And the Bible says we're to keep away from them. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Ultimately, we have to turn them over to God, who is their ultimate judge. Isaiah 44, 25, God foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense. Jeremiah 23, 32, indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. And Jeremiah 27, 15, I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They're prophesying lies in my name. Therefore, I will banish you and you will perish, both you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Oh, this is a dire warning to anybody who follows false prophets because you're going to end up in their same judgment. Revelation 2.21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Notice the love of God here. Even this woman, even though this woman leads many astray and pretends to speak for God when she's not, he still gives her time to repent. And we should also allow false prophets to time to repent. If they're rebuked, they need to repent. If they don't repent and very importantly turn from their wicked ways, God will judge them and we must avoid them. Many examples of this, but Benny Hinn and many other third wave leaders have repeatedly made false prophecies. Benny Hinn prophesied in 1994 that all homosexuals would be dead by 1994 or 95 at the latest. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that sure took an opposite turn, didn't it? Of course, this didn't happen. Yet Hinn Hin has never repented of those false prophecies. They've taught a mountain of false doctrine. Hinn allegedly tried to repent of word of faith prosperity teachings, but then he turned right around and went back to his wicked ways and returned to teaching those same false doctrines. He always had people like Kenneth Copeland and Rod Parsley on his TV show. And they were teaching the most blatant word of faith lies. And Hinn agreed with them, even adding his own further heresy to the discussion. You know what? That's not repentance. It's false repentance in order to try to fool people into following him. People like Benny Hinn should be avoided because God will judge him for his false prophecy and teaching. We need to avoid him and warn others to stay away from him and all others who live in rebellion and unrepentance for their false teachings, false prophecies, and false anointings. God is gracious and he's the God of second chances. But there does come a time when he stops giving second chances. And we see that in the next point of Revelation 2, 22 through 23. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they uh, repent of her ways, and I will strike her children dead. To follow a false prophecy is to commit spiritual adultery. It's also possible that the people of the Church of Thyatira were committing physical adultery with this woman. The judgment of God in this case was to cause her to be ill and all those who followed her to suffer with her. Even in this, God was allowing them time to repent of her ways. Notice, that, though, that Jezebel is no longer being given a chance to repent and her children will die for her sin. There's a time and a place when the grace of God runs out. That's what I call a scary time. 
Many who once believed and refused to repent have died. Among many examples were Ananias and Sapphira, Saul and Judas. There are ways to fall from grace. Some depend on the law to save them or salvation by works. Galatians 5, 4, you, are, you who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Another is to reject Christ or lose your faith in Christ, placing it in something or someone else, even a false Christ, a false gospel, a false spirit. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 gives a dire warning. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Another way and one that concerns this passage is to allow false teaching. 2 Peter 3.17, Therefore, dear friends, since you've all, you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. Guess what? That was spoken to Christians. Revelation 2.23b goes on, Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repeat, re repay each one of you according to your deeds. You know what? We have to answer for our acts of falsely prophesying or following those who do. This is serious business. It's something almost every letter in the New Testament talks about over and over again. I don't see how people miss it. Hebrews 10.31, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God doesn't look at the outward man, but he searches the heart. 1 Samuel 16.7, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God knows in whom we are placing our faith. God knows the hearts of those who truly believe and obey him. He also knows the hearts of those who profess to be Christians, or perhaps even believed for a while. Still, inwardly, they were enticed away, enticed away by seeking after things like power, prestige, a desire to look holy in the eyes of others and longing to be entertained rather than follow Jesus and obey the word of God. And of course, seeking after money. Revelation 2.24, Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. <laughs> it's interesting he talks about Satan's so-called deep secrets. One of the evidence and hallmarks of witchcraft is secret knowledge or deep secrets. In witchcraft, words supposedly have power. Symbols supposedly have meaning. And demons have names, which invoked supposedly give you, you know, power over them. Always be aware of people who claim to have secret revelation knowledge that doesn't agree with scripture or claims to add to it. Martin Luther made an interesting statement. It is a most ungodly and dangerous business to abandon the certain and revealed will of God to search into the hidden mysteries of God. Today, a group of so-called prophets, quote-unquote, claim that Christianity is entering a new phase. They're preaching this constantly up there in Bethel with Bill Johnson, etc. They claim that we were going to see new things, a new breed, a new revelation that basically goes beyond what's in Scripture. Beware of false prophets like Paul Kane, Bob Jones, Mike Bickle, Rick Joyner, etc., on and on and on. The Bible's clear about the authority of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, all scripture 
is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is the last word against which everything else must be measured. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. John 17, 17, sanctifying, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Paul also instructed the church not to go beyond what's written in scripture. We all know this verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us, us the meaning of the saying. Do not go beyond what's written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. So we need to take the word in daily so that we will not sin against God. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is why it's so important to study the scripture, to memorize scripture, to allow the Lord to imprint that on our hearts and minds. Fortunately, there will be some Christians in Thyatira who did not follow Jezebel or her secret revelation teachings, her false prophecies that had no support in Scripture. Revelation 2.25, only hold on to what you have until I come. Don't renounce the faith. Remain true to the name of Jesus. Be faithful to the point of death. Don't grow weary persevere and now he says precept number 21 hold on till he comes it's significant that jesus tells this first century church to hold on till he comes remember this is jesus taught talking not john john was in exile imprisoned on patmos we now know that jesus did not come then but is still coming Therefore, this challenge is true for us also. This is a teaching that's not taught often in the church day, but I believe as we see harder times coming, persecution and tribulation, this teaching will come back to the light of day again. There are many verses about holding on to the word addressed to Christians. John 8, 31, to the Jews, who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confessions and Confession in the presence of many witnesses. Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is faithful as son over God's house. And we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Hebrews 3, 14, we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. Hebrews 4.14, 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And finally, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything, hold on to the good. We are to hold on. Revelation 2.26, To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Something is added this time to the repeated admonishment to overcome, and that is precept number 22. Do God's will to the end. Now our example is Jesus Christ. He always did the will of his Father in heaven. 
John 6, 38, for I've come down from heaven and not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 14, 31, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing of himself. He can, he can do only what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And Philippians 2, 6 through 8, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Following Christ, we must also do his will to the end. Ephesians 6.6, 6, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but be slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you will stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Hebrews 10.36, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. And finally, 1 John 2, 17, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. How can we know the will of God for our lives? You're not going to know it unless you're in the word. All the precepts, precepts are there. There, might, they, there may not be exact instructions such as, you know, turn off State Street and then go down to 222 Capitol Avenue. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit will illuminate, illuminate the important things we need to know from God's word. That's how the Holy Spirit teaches Christians. Is it the will of God for you to witness to your neighbor? It's already answered. What should you pray for? It's already there. How do I explain the gospel message to someone else? It's already there. The answers are there. And if we're in the word daily, we will begin to hide the word in our hearts and know the answers to these questions without even having to hunt for them in our Bibles. To the Christian who overcomes and does the will of God to the end, the Lord has promised that we will rule with him. This is not a promise for this present age. But this is talking about the millennial kingdom of God. Some teach that we must take dominion of this earth now. But we cannot do that until Christ physically returns. What will happen, however, is that many Christians will be deceived into joining an apostate world church. And the Antichrist will eventually use that to bring himself to power and dominate the world for three and a half years. All the new world order, global governance events in that you know basically ramped up in 2000 exist. We will hear more and more of these things in the coming years. This promise was given to Thyatira because they could look forward to a time when, instead of suffering under Satan-controlled prophets like Jezebel, they would have real authority and freedom under Christ someday in his millennial kingdom. I think it's a real possibility that we will yearn for this promise to come true as we begin to feel the harsh dictates of self-proclaimed apostles and prophets in the apostate world church. It's already happening now. O oh, to have Christ as this world's faithful and just ruler and to rule with him. Revelation 2.27, he, he will rule, with them, rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. This verse is taken from a prophecy in Psalm 2.9. It proves that Jesus was, has not yet fulfilled all the scriptural prophecy. 
he must still return to rule and judge the earth in the millennium. He will clean out the earth of those who rebel against him. He will defeat satanic forces and throw Satan into the abyss for a thousand years. It will be a time of peace and rest as the earth has never seen or will ever see again. The first time Jesus came, he came as a suffering Messiah and fulfilled all the scriptural prophecies concerning that aspect of his plan. The second time, he comes as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to rule and reign from the throne of David, fulfilling all those prophecies. The Jews made the mistake of thinking that he would fulfill the prophecies about his kingship so they missed the prophecies about the Messiah who would come and die for the sins of the world. Because he suffered and died in submission to the Father, he was forever given all power and authority. He is forever King of Kings. His name is written on his body. Revelation 2, 28 and 29, it will all, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who overcome will have Christ himself forever because he is the bright and morning star. They will share in his glory and dominion forever. Revelation 2.16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David the bright and morning star. There's also another verse that mentions the morning star rising in our hearts. This is the hope of glory and an eternity with Christ. The day will dawn, the morning star will rise, and we will never again endure the darkness we're in now. 2 Peter 1.19 and we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Mm -hmm.